afterwards for the recording. So, so I thought what we'd talk about today is um, how confidence, or what you may call faith, belief, trust, acceptance of the teachings, this is the Pali word sadha, um, how that confidence conditions the path, the path of liberation. So this is the path towards real, lasting, deep happiness, the end of all defilements of the mind, the end of craving and aversion and delusion. And to talk about how that confidence helps us to start on the path and gives us a helping hand all the way through, in particular to help and give us the courage to let go, little by little, into deeper truths, deeper experiences than those we may be familiar with already. Yeah, because it takes a bit of confidence to step into the unknown. So how do we do that and why is confidence so important on the path? So confidence, sadha or trust or belief, is one of the foundations along with sila, virtue. And Bhikkhu Bodhi gives a really nice um, little simile of a tree. He said that sadha, confidence, can be likened to the seed of the tree. And the reason for that is because it gives us the impetus, the initial impulse through which to take up the training. And it's that confidence or faith that nourishes the training. So then the virtue would be the roots. So virtue provides that really strong foundation for the training, for the practice to develop upon. And um, giving grounding to our spiritual endeavours, just as roots give grounding to a tree. And then in this same simile, he says that um, stillness, what is often translated as um, concentration, but I much prefer stillness, would be the trunk of the tree, the symbol of strength, non-vacillation and stability. And wisdom would be the branches, which yield the flowers and fruits of enlightenment. Yeah. So you can see that we need this seed to begin the journey, and it gives us that initial impulse to actually take up the path. And I know that for a lot of us, especially perhaps in the West, the word faith can really conjure up a lot of alarm bells. You know, it tends to have that connotation of blind faith, something to, you know, just kind of give ourselves to without questioning or really analysing. But the Buddha, even when using the word faith, really warned against that kind of um, blind belief. And he actually said that, um, you know, you have to use your intellect. There is a critical element to faith. But there's also a heart element to it. There is also an attribute of devotion, an aspect of, you know, being able to really trust in someone, believe in someone or something higher than oneself, right? So to really believe in something in the Germanic language apparently is the same as to love. So to have belief in is like, I believe in you or I believe in myself, right? And this is a kind of love that enables you to give yourself wholeheartedly to whatever task is in front of you. So that kind of sense of loving devotion can really engender a lot of feeling of gratitude, of joy, of confidence, and give you the inspiration to start walking. And yet we have to um, you know, bring in and keep hold of that critical, intellectual, um, discerning part of the mind as well. And it's interesting, actually, in the suttas, I was reading about um, how the Buddha talks about it, and he actually categorised even reason and tradition and learning that you've done in the past in the same category as faith. He said, for all of these, if one is a preserver of the truth, one does not come to a definite conclusion, only this is true and everything else is wrong, when as yet there is no discovery of truth. And I think that's so interesting. He said, it's okay to say my faith is this, you know, this is what I believe, this is what I understand, what I reason out clearly, what I've learned from my books. But as long as you want to be a preserver of truth, you have to actually discover that for yourself. And that's in the Majjhima number 95, uh, verse 13. That's for anybody who's really interested in the Buddha's teachings from the suttas, because I think it's lovely when we actually start to contact the Buddha's own words and resonate with them. So for me, I suppose, the aspect of uh, confidence and faith has always given me a lot of energy to pursue the path, you know, the motivation, the inspiration to engage in order to discover things for myself, not just in an end, you know, as an end in itself. And the Buddha also said that one of the best ways to practice and to um, basically to show devotion, to show um, confidence in the Buddha is to develop your own practice, 
right? He said, the best way to revere, esteem, worship, pay respect to me is to put into practice my teachings. So he spent his whole life not only awakening for his own benefit, but actually trying to uh, teach, walking on foot all across India, you know, to disseminate these teachings that had worked for him. And the amazing thing about the Dhamma is that it is a path, it is a training that can be applied by anybody and yield the same results. And for me, meeting the first people um, who I developed confidence in as having experienced some of the deeper um, aspects of the path was just such an enormous boost in my confidence because I could see that these were people just like me who live in the same time and age, You know, at first, I guess my first teacher like this was my Burmese preceptor. And I still had a slight bias that perhaps, you know, the Asian monks or people in Asia who'd been born into Buddhism were somehow a bit more evolved than ours and they really understood it at a deeper level. You know, sometimes we can romanticise exotic or foreign cultures. And of course, he was a very, very impressive person, full of metta, and uh, just sitting in his presence seemed to help to overcome a lot of the coarser hindrances to meditation. And I'd sit there and literally feel showered with metta, feel so safe and also quite elevated and uplifted. You know, so there was definitely a tangible sense of being around something really powerful, something very peaceful, in a similar way that you may have experienced the practice with Ajahn Brahm this morning. But really, I guess meeting Ajahn Brahm also had a huge impact on me because here was somebody from my own cultural background. (laughs) You know, I mean, he likes to say he's just like everyone else and nothing special, and certainly he has some special qualities. He's very, very intelligent and seemed to always be a kind of sunny character, you know, got up to tricks and stuff like all kids do. But, you know, he, he seemed to have a natural capacity for meditation. But one does always have to keep in mind that, you know, we don't know what somebody's been practicing previously. Whether you believe in past lives or not, I don't know. But to me, it looks like a continuum. And to meet somebody who can be so accessible and so human, you know, and in a way kind of, um, um, well, relaxed (laughs) and sort of a bit, what do you say, Like like a tree in the forest, you know? I had the idea that people should always be very still and every little movement of the body should be like incredibly refined. But it's not about that. It's about where you're coming from. It's about purifying the heart. And meeting someone like Ajahn Brahm who understands my own cultural conditioning, you know, and has also met those obstacles in himself has just been so um, productive of confidence for me in the path. And also giving me confidence in myself, because such beings never differentiate themselves from others by thinking that they're anything special, you know. And having seen the results of the path, they understand that it's due to the causes, right? You plant a seed, and that seed ends up generating flowers and fruits, depending on the nature of the seed, and the soil, and the sun, the wind, the rain, yeah? So it's nothing to do with an ability or a lack of ability. It's all about nurturing the conditions, And the really interesting thing about confidence or faith in the Buddha's teachings is that he actually talks about what gives rise to that confidence, what are some of the conditions for that confidence to arise in the first place. So one of the things, he says, is that the nutriment for confidence is hearing the teachings. This sounds quite obvious, right? You have to be able to hear the teachings, come in contact with the Buddha's teachings to develop any kind of confidence or faith in those. And for me, when I first heard the Four Noble Truths, it was such a huge relief. I read something Bhikkhu Bodhi wrote the other day. He said something like, um, it's sort of fancy language, but it made me laugh, really. He said, it's, um, sometimes the joy is a relief of um, pent-up tensions, of having reached an impasse with existential angst, or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, in, in shorthand, I guess, that means... Uh, that I personally reached a point where I thought, what is the point of all this? You know, I can't really see a way out of suffering as long as I'm a sentient being, as long as there is um, greed, hatred and delusion in the world and in the hearts and minds of living beings. You know, we're going to keep on causing ourselves and others suffering. And there must be some meaning to that. I mean, we can't be born here only to suffer and to try to kind of um, alleviate that suffering temporarily, either by distracting ourselves or numbing out or maybe by, you know, just enjoying life as much as we can through the senses or, or just kind of despondency. Oh, well, there's nothing I can do, just better carry on anyway. 
I kind of felt like that didn't make sense. And when I suddenly heard that the Buddha spoke about suffering as a reality of life, the fact that there is suffering, I thought, gosh, so there's nothing wrong with me. You know, it's actually supposed to be this way. And yet, of course, the next thing he said was that suffering has its cause. And because it has its cause, there's a way to eradicate that cause. And when the cause is eradicated, the suffering is eradicated too. So it's such a pragmatic and beautiful teaching, you know, like the same as a doctor's diagnosis. They diagnose the cause, they try to eradicate the cause if they're a good doctor, rather than just dealing with the symptoms. And then when that cause is eradicated, the disease disappears. Mm. So this was really amazing for me and gave me the energy, helped me rouse the energy to put forth some effort in the practice by, first of all, encountering um, the opportunity to sit on retreats. Mm -hmm. But um, even before hearing the teachings, (laughs) or maybe not before hearing them, but the thing is, not everybody who hears the teachings will develop the path, right? Some people hear the teachings and they still don't end up rousing that Um, sense of urgency, if you like, to take significant steps on the path, to really start to look at their behaviour, start to purify their conduct of body, speech and mind, and align themselves more fully, you know, with the right intentions of practice, with compassion, with loving kindness, with letting go. So why is it that some people, when they hear the teachings, take to them and others don't? And it's a surprising answer in a way, but perhaps not. And it comes from the Upanissa Sutta, which is one of the beautiful suttas in, um, I think, I think it's in the Samyutta Nikaya. And um, the Buddha actually says there that the proximate cause for confidence is suffering. Yeah? And this is so wonderful because previously, when we were looking into the dependent origination, um, the whole sequence of causality went from delusion and then through craving and then into like basically old age sickness and death, just in a nutshell. But here it's almost um, juxtaposing a different version of dependent origination. And what happens is instead of that link from craving into birth, sickness, old age and death, the Buddha substitutes suffering for old age, sickness and death. And from suffering, another circle, another chain of dependent um, liberation, you could say, begins, right? So this means we're born. We don't have to inevitably go just all the time into old age, sickness and death, birth, old age, sickness and death, again and again and again. There's actually a way to, you know, understand suffering and find a way out. And that way out starts by developing confidence in the teachings. So we have to understand that suffering is pervasive and there is such a thing as an existential suffering that we can only, you know, we can't actually fully escape it without making an end of samsara. I guess I'm going kind of straight down the line here, which I didn't necessarily intend to, but such is life. But the beautiful thing too is that this process is a natural process. And I think this gives us great hope. It's an extraordinarily positive message. And there's a lovely simile that the Buddha uses. He says it's like, um, well, one thing he says is that from confidence, you don't have to make an aspiration, may joy arise, because it's natural for one with confidence that joy then starts to arise. Yeah. So this, again, is that relief of having found the teachings and also the willingness to start applying those teachings and the resulting joy that they bring, especially from training in things like good conduct, bodily mental and verbal conduct that brings a certain sense of joy yeah and from joy um, we don't have to make an aspiration may I develop what we call PT which is the very pleasant rapture that can arise in meditation because it's quite natural that from joy the PT arises and so the continuation carries on through tranquility and then through happiness or contentment and all the way into samadhi states, deep meditation. And from there, the Buddha says, we can see things as they truly are. In other words, the knowledge and vision of the path can arise, and we gain awakening through that process. So it all starts with the confidence. And the Buddha has a lovely little simile um, in that sutta, which I just wanted to read out. He said, just as when the rain descends heavily upon some mountain top." The water flows down along the slope and fills the clefts, gullies and creeks. These being filled fill up the pools. 
These being filled, fill up the ponds. These being filled, fill up the streams. The streams being filled, fill up the rivers. The rivers being filled, fill up the great ocean. And in just the same way, he says, that suffering is the supporting condition for confidence. Confidence is the supporting condition for joy. Joy for piti, or rapture, rapture for tranquility. Tranquility for this deep contentment. And that is the proximate cause for the deep states of samadhi. So can you see how this path may seem to be a negative thing on first glance? You know, we talk a lot about the suffering. But as soon as we come into contact with the teachings and develop some confidence in those, the whole path changes direction and it starts to lead the opposite way, in the way out of suffering, the way towards liberation. And it's interesting to me that the first next step after the confidence is joy. Yeah, so this means that after we have developed some confidence and belief or we start to put our heart into the practice, we don't come to the cushion and, and just sit there suffering, you know. We're, we're supposed to come to the cushion and actually reflect a little bit on the beauty of the teachings, yeah, that the teachings were perfectly explained by the Buddha to be experienced by anybody, yeah. And the Buddha was perfectly enlightened, teacher of gods and humans, it says, and also to have confidence in his awakening and that in that awakening that, that awakening is possible, not only for a Buddha, but for all of us. And of course to have confidence in those who've practiced since the time of the Buddha and have made steps towards awakening, you know, in whatever degree that is. These things are really wonderful and we can do these as conscientious reflections when we sit down to meditate. Another really lovely reflection is to start the practice by just remembering some of your own virtue, some of your own good qualities, goodness, you know, things about yourself that you really respect and appreciate. Even little kindnesses that you've done for other people or things that you haven't done that you could have done, as in negative things, right? Where you've practiced restraint and you've you know, managed to avoid causing suffering to yourself or somebody else. So these things are all really beautiful ways to um, start generating some of this joy, which does happen quite naturally, but we can also encourage it in the practice. Yeah. Also reflecting on the uh, joy of being surrounded by wise friends, being here today you know, with other people who are practicing on the path. It's really special. And we're all here for the same purpose. Just because we're interested, we want to know more. And we're really trying to do our best and take responsibility for our lives and for our actions. Yeah, this is one of the things that does differentiate, I think, people who start to come to the path and people who are in the world sort of not understanding the consequences of their actions and behaviour and blaming everything else around them for that. You know, we can't blame them either because if they haven't come in contact with looking at it in a different way, then they're bound to be products of their conditioning just as we are. And so, you know, the other thing about suffering is that it can give rise to this great compassion and empathy for others. So suffering isn't necessarily something to be avoided. Yeah? And by facing that suffering, we can actually start to develop compassion and a sense of joy that we now have a path that's going to gradually, gradually take us in a different direction. So as I said, that joy starts to refine as we meditate into rapture. And this is the point in meditation when we start to get a strong sense of mindfulness and energy and interest in the meditation object. So I don't know about most of you here, but if you're practicing, say, breath meditation, this is what Ajahn Brahm calls the pivotal point. The breath starts to appear quite delightful. You become just really peaceful with the breath and the breath seems to fill and fulfill the mind, you know, so that the mind starts to settle. And the breath, rather than looking boring and kind of tiresome and vague, perhaps you keep on slipping on it, slipping off it again, it starts to stay in the mind because the mind's getting bright and it starts to see more deeply into that process of breathing, into the breath. There's something very delightful, very simple, very humble, but quite fulfilling to the mind. It's almost as though the breath starts to fill up the whole mind, until it takes over at some point in this process. And again, all of this happens very naturally. And what um, you may notice if you've been practicing, especially with Ajahn Brahm, um, is that this thing does happen very um, organically. And the more one can let go 
into the process, the more one can give their trust, give their confidence, now not only to the teachings, but to the actual meditation object, the more the meditation just starts to unfold all on its own. Yeah, And every time this sense of self gets involved, hey, you know, what's going on? I should be more with it. I should be this. I should be that. When's the PT coming up? When's the bliss coming? Where are the lights in the mind? As soon as we start to do that, obviously that's pretty coarse. But even at a subtler level, as soon as the mind leans in and thinks, what next? You know, or just gets a little bit excited, or a little bit like, whoa, I'm not sure what's happening now. The controller comes back in and the whole thing starts to un- unravel again. You lose that sense of peace, that sense of contentment. <laughs> hello, whoever's with Andrea. I just have to say hello because it's a very beautiful picture to see on my screen. <laughs> nice to have you here. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so this PT is a really beautiful part of the um, process of meditation and it's that delight that holds the mind still for longer periods with its object. And after a while, sometimes, you know, it takes time to get used to this kind of bliss in the mind and in the body because especially if you're not used to it or have some kind of Western guilt complex or ideas that we shouldn't deserve to feel happy in meditation, it can be a little bit challenging to let go into it. But what I've noticed is that after some time, the mind feels more and more at ease with it and more and more able to let go and to appreciate it. And when the mind kind of has its fill, then it starts to settle down. It's almost like at first it's very interesting and exciting, but after a while you feel like that's enough. And it's not a verbal thing, it's just a natural thing that it all starts to settle. And you move into even deeper stages of peace, which are called tranquility. Yeah, tranquility of body. First of all, so that you can sit for longer and longer periods quite effortlessly. And also tranquility of mind. And this is when the mind starts becoming very still, very silent and just peaceful. And then from there, the Buddha says that you don't have to make any volition. May happiness or deep contentment arise because it's just natural that this happiness and contentment arises. So we have to remember at this point it's a different kind of happiness. It's not the excitable happiness. It's a happiness born of tranquility, born of peace, the bliss of peace, if you like. And this is quite a powerful energy state. You know, it's, um, it's not a dull state of mind. It's actually a state of heightened mindfulness. And this is the proximate cause for the deep meditations of jhanas. Yeah, so at this point, this is when some people get lights in the mind. Not everybody does, actually. Some people experience what is called a nimitta, more as a, um, a sort of physical sensation. It's not really physical, but it's perceived more as maybe the shape of the body or something like this. But the actual experience is mental bliss. You're starting to perceive things more and more through the mind sense door than through the body sense door. And then you go into these deep states of samadhi, which I think Ajahn Brahm is best qualified to talk about, because you need to have repeated experience of these things to really establish yourself in those states and and really get the best um, kind of, what would you say, um, give them a chance to yield the insights that can follow. Yeah. So Ajahn Brahm has been practicing deep meditation for many years, even since before he ordained. And, um, and yet it can still take time to really overcome the hindrances fully. Of course, in those states of meditation, the hindrances are completely absent when you come out. And at that time, the Buddha says, you have a chance to see things as they really are. Yeah, the hindrances have actually gone. So there's no craving, there's no aversion, doubt, restlessness, worry, or dullness, right? The mind is perfectly poised. And the Buddha likened the mind that's come out of samadhi to a a mind of um, melted gold. So the gold has been softened and melted down, and now it's fit for work. So he says, in the same way, the mind that comes out of these deep states of meditation is now soft and malleable and fit for work. And the other nice thing is he says it's unbiased. And this is really important because I think a lot of the time we're we're very afraid to trust and fully let go of our rational mind. And we may even think we already understand, you know, the truths of impermanence, of suffering, of non-self. But actually, we're still quite vested in the delusion of permanence, in the delusion that there may be some happiness in this world, 
And certainly, we're very afraid of letting go of a sense of self. And because of this, because the hindrances are operating in this way, we can't actually see the deeper level of those truths. We can only see them superficially, you know. And so you really need a mind very empowered by deep states of samadhi to be able to penetrate things that at other times seem maybe quite unpalatable or quite, um, you don't really want to see it, yeah. But at this time, the mind's so resourced and so bright and happy that it has no vested interest, it doesn't mind. And it has the power to stay with experience for long enough to penetrate much more deeply. And so I think it's important to um, remember this, not necessarily that you must, you know, I mean, Ajahn Brahm also sort of hesitates sometimes, not very much, to talk about deep states of meditation in case people start craving for them or thinking that they have to get them, you know, they have to attain and they can't gain insight without them. But it is a continuum, as I said, and the deeper the samadhi, the deeper the insight can be. Yeah? And um, so it is a gradual training. It's something that we can put the causes into place for. And they start with the confidence in this particular case, allowing you know, our own understanding of suffering to mature and to give rise to that confidence that gives us the inspiration to start taking steps on the path. Yeah. And just to notice that at every step, whenever you let go, more joy arises. Yeah. The more you can let go, the more free you feel, the more peace you experience. And so it's really this trust that gives you that ability to let go into the unknown. Yeah. The other thing about samadhi practices is that they kind of um, cushion the mind in a sense. So that, you know, rather than just going straight into insight practices that look at impermanence and non-self and suffering, which can be quite confronting, we have this um, kind of way to rouse happiness in the mind. Yeah, because samadhi states are very happy states. And that kind of gives a, a cushioning to the mind so that we don't get rattled or shaken up too much in negative ways by truths of impermanence, etc. So I just wanted to give this encouragement and to talk about the confidence and the kind of confidence the Buddha encouraged and to show how a little bit how it can go hand in hand during our journey on this path. And I found a lovely quote that seemed to sum it up. This is actually from Ajahn Suchito, who was, um, used to be one of my favourite teachers, I guess. Nowadays, I'm sort of more or less listening to Ajahn Brahm and other teachers. Not that many teachers. But I haven't heard Ajahn Suchito's talks for a while, but I found this little um, quote that I thought was really lovely. He says that the point of deep learning is to go to the edge of what we know and where we control There, the nobility of our life, the nobility of our purpose, the aspiration of life says, keep going past the area where you can't control it anymore and trust. And he says, that for me is the heart of devotion. It is not a surrender of responsibility, but a profound recognition of what the responsibility of our being is. To live in accordance with truth, to honour truth, and to trust the truth of this journey. I've changed the last bit because he said to trust the truth of life as it is, but I don't know. Can we really trust it? I'm not sure. We have to keep a very open mind and keep questioning. Yeah, so this path starts with sadha, but it's the sadha, the faith, that leads us on a path of discovery. So we should always keep that open mind. And as long as we don't yet know, remain open to possibilities that are beyond what we can currently verify through our own personal experience. Yeah? Good. So, I'm so far more or less on time. And I thought that now, if you're all still comfortable enough and ready, we could do some meditation for about 20 minutes. So if you want to stand up and have a stretch or change your position, please do so. That's absolutely fine. Is the sound still okay? Yeah. I can hear a little bit of sort of scratching sound. I don't know. 
Maybe it's just interference from someone's device. Maybe mine. Getting seated. Asking the body how it would feel most at ease. And as you close your eyes, you start to notice the body sitting, the weight of the body on the cushion or on your chair, perhaps on your sofa. And just making that connection with the ground, allowing the energies, maybe the reverberations of my words, or the thoughts in your mind to settle down by bringing the awareness down into the bottom of the body, the heavy parts which are pressing or seated on the ground. And as your eyes are closed, you'll notice so much of the world has disappeared. There may still be just some sounds around you, perhaps people in the room nearby, (coughs) perhaps the wind. So much busyness has been put down. Just taking a moment to savour that silence, that peace and stillness around you. Recognising that the only thing you need to do now is just to fully arrive. And I'd like to start this meditation by inviting you to bring up something about yourself, some quality, attribute, particular strength or virtue that you really appreciate or even would like to deepen, would like to cultivate further. It might be your giving your service, the kindness in your heart, your reliability, your honesty, or maybe something that you've done for someone recently, the love that you give to your child. Bring that to mind and see if you can recognize 
and even celebrate your own goodness. How does that feel? And with this recognition of your own goodness, you're not perfect. But you deserve your own love. Just bring your awareness to the body. Perhaps to the top of the head or if you prefer you can start with the tips of the toes. And we're going to just gently allow this awareness infused with kindness to spread throughout the body. Almost imagining it like the rays of sun shining through each and every cell. Wherever this kind awareness shines, you become aware of the sensations in that area. And give them some kindness. Soothing, relaxing any aches, tightnesses, tensions or even physical pains. Always noticing the way that you relate to whatever you encounter. And adding kindness, gentleness, and peace to the way you relate. If there are any areas that maybe feel sick, for example, I always often have a little bit of indigestion or burning sensation in my tummy. I just linger longer in that area, give it more care. Imagining the way my mother would soothe me to sleep when I was little in a similar way, soothing the sensations in that area.
And as these sensations, the kindness that you extend towards this experience deepens, you may start to notice the mind quietening. The thoughts coming in and just passing through like clouds in the sky. And noticing the space between the thoughts. Extending the same <clears throat> kindness and warmth to the silence in your mind. Maybe a very rare and precious visitor. Noticing the beauty in the silent moment. And as the mind continues to quieten, (coughs) you may notice the breath enters the mind. If it wants to come in, allow it to come. If your mind's ready, it'll stay. Whatever comes into the mind, make the way you treat that experience the most important thing in the world. So that the silence, the peace, the breath is attracted to the softness and beauty of your mind.
Trusting in the silence. Trusting in the process. Gently letting go. So now we're coming to the end of this short period of meditation. Just again bringing your mind to this body sitting. Spreading that kind awareness through the whole body. Maybe experiencing it as one unit. And again recognizing this being seated here. Yourself. As a person so in need, so worthy and deserving of your own kindness and care. gently extending thoughts of love and kindness to yourself. May I be happy. May I be free. May I be healed. May I be at peace. Choosing whatever words or sentiments really resonate for you. And just gently offering them as gifts to this being who you know so well. Smiling at yourself from inside, smiling into your body, smiling into your heart. And at the end of the bell, you can gently bring that smile outward into the world. So I'll ring the bell three times. And at the end of the third ringing, you can gently open your eyes.
good. So, now is the time to have a little break. 